Welcome back. You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with journalist and author Christina Patterson and the Evening Standards defence editor Robert Fox. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. The constantly changing and developing situation in Russia leads many of the papers tonight. The Sunday Telegraph says the Wagner Group forces threatening Moscow have turned back after striking a deal with Vladimir Putin not to spill any Russian blood. But, says the Sunday Times, the whole incident has left Vladimir Putin humiliated. This is the front of the Sunday Express, Russia on the brink. Similar headline in the Sunday Mirror, Putin pushed to brink. The Star says the Russian president has vanished from Moscow and pictures Wagner Group leader Yevgeny Prizgovin uh, with the headline, Putin, the boot in. While the people also pictures both men with the headline, Dogs of War. Well, a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And we are joined tonight by journalist and author Christina Patterson and the Evening Standards defence editor Robert Fox. Welcome to both of you. Let's um, start with the Sunday Times, if we could, um, first up. And their headline... Putin humiliated by mutiny. Uh, Robert, would you agree with, with that headline? Is that the case? Has President Putin been humiliated by this rebellion, although now quashed, it seems? We'll um, come to that later about what, what has happened to Putin himself. Uh, but I think that it is the first time, particularly during the special military operation, the war in Ukraine since February last year, where his strategy has been shown and importantly shown to Russians in Moscow and in the cities of the West, Ros Moscow, Petersburg, um, that it, it isn't what it says it is and it is not working. And I think that's the piece that Prigozhin has got across and that's the piece that he now owns. The papers have, of course, found it very difficult to keep up with the news, and there are developments happening all the time. But the Sunday Times and the Sunday Telegraph are pretty good. Very good quotes from the Sunday Telegraph uh, about what Mr Prigozhin thought he was doing. I'm not a mutineer. I'm a, I, I'm a patriot. I want to support this country. I want to get rid of... He doesn't quite use the word scumbags, but he said, I want to get rid of all those people in charge who are very corrupt. Uh, and, Christina, you, you've um, obviously had a look at the, the article as well. They, they are focusing... I mean, the headline is about um, Putin being humiliated. Do you think that is the underlying fact from this rebellion that we have seen today? I think there, there are lots of underlying facts, uh, not least of which it, is that Russia is clearly in the hand of... in the hand of warlords now, uh, because Priyajin has shown himself to be, in some ways, as powerful as Putin. And uh, the fact that Putin has essentially uh, bowed to his demands, we don't know exactly what they were. Obviously, some kind of face-saving formula has been reached, and the, the ostensible details are that Prigozhin can go and... Uh, Prigozhin, sorry, can go and uh, live in Belarus. I'm sure he's been dying to go and live in Belarus. And that he will no longer face 20 years in jail or whatever it was he was facing this morning. But, and of course, Putin absolutely has been humiliated. Uh, this is, as, as Robert just said, the first time that he has been exposed in quite this way. I'm sure there's increasing suspicion across Russia about his strategy, but we have to remember that most people get their news through him. If you, any dissent is punished with imprisonment or worse. And so, you know, the vast majority of Russians will be swallowing the party line and actually have no choice but to do that unless they want to risk their lives. But Russia is all about strong men. This whole thing, alarmingly, is all about strong men. And by strong 
strong women, people with armies behind them, and who do not care what happens to the young men they use as cannon fodder. The reports we get of the brutality that both, uh, that certainly that Russian soldiers inflict on Ukrainians, but also that 18 year old Russian boys who've been sent away from home for the first time are essentially just being slaughtered, just fed into Putin's meat grinder for this crazed, crazed uh, enterprise to restore some kind of fantasy that has been washing around in his head that hasn't really been articulated. The whole thing is tragic. And I think today there's been a kind of temptation to think my enemy's enemy is my friend. You know, oh, isn't this exciting? Perhaps Putin will be humiliated. Perhaps he'll stand down. Perhaps he'll even leave. But it's extremely unlikely that this is going to lead to, you know, a happy ending for anyone. This is more lawlessness, more violence. And what looks it like now is that uh, Prigozhin and Putin are a kind of united front about to feed yet more people into the Ukrainian war. So I very much doubt that this is going to be good news for Ukraine. A uh, direct quote from uh, Prigozhin uh, today saying, we got to with 200 kilometres of Moscow in 24 hours without spilling a drop of the blood of our fighters. Now the moment has come when blood could be shed. Robert, do you believe that this is the, the real reason why that march to Moscow was stopped, that he didn't want to, to lose any troops? I think we're overthinking this. I was talking to a friend who is very experienced in Russia and Russia um, hinterlands, and she's been talking to her friends via uh, a covered uh, a, a means, uh, versions of Telegram and so on. And she said, it's worse than what you can think. She's half Italian. And she was saying, Italians like seeing plots in everything. The plot, the point is, this was not by Karl Marx. This was a Marx Brothers plot. But actually, Prigozhin, it now seems, didn't really know that clearly what he was doing from one minute to the next. Why it began is that I think he knew he and his troops, so-called, were in trouble. They were being slaughtered massively on the Bakhmut front, and they, they had to get out. Now you come to the point about the deal, which is extremely interesting. There is a deal, and we only know bits of it. And what he demanded, of course, was the head of defence, Defence Minister Shoigu, and the head of the operation and the commander-in-chief, the chief of defence staff, Gerasimov, were fired. We don't know where that's got. And Putin, having... It got on television immediately and said that this is a stab in the back, it's terrible, this must be deal dealt with, this man's a terrible traitor. Now he's now saying he's not quite a, quite a traitor after all, and he's going off, because I've done a deal with uh, Lukashenko in Belarus. And that's very dodgy indeed, because I tell you, a lot of people in Belarus don't want 25,000 uh, Wagner thugs, because a lot of them are convicts with very, very serious records uh, uh, behind them. Exactly as we've been hearing, it is chaos, violence, and it's in a spiral. And we don't quite know the direction of that spiral yet. Mm. And, Christina, we read in the Sunday Telegraph that um, a key element of the, the deal that, that was struck um, via Lukashenko was that the Kremlin would drop plans to abolish the, the, Varga military, the Wagner military group. Yes. Um, I mean, yeah, I think what's been interesting here is that um, Prigozhin has, has done quite well on Telegram at presenting himself as kind of some, some more moral figure, sort of um, disapproving of the way that Russian troops are being sacrificed in this war. He is the guy who went in and uh, went into prisons last September and said, oh, well, you know, you can be let out of prison if you join my army. And then promptly, you know, enormous numbers of those people went straight to their deaths. You know, he's not a nice guy. And um, I think the reason he's been protesting because, uh, as Robert said, huge numbers of his uh, soldiers have been slaughtered and haven't been given, it, you know, they, they're not getting the, the weapons and protection they need. Um, and there were, you know, we don't know the exact politics between Putin and him and why there were uh, plans to uh, disband Wagner. But, you know, the, these guys want one thing. They want power. That's what they want, and they will do literally anything to get it. And that's why this thing is so terrifying, because they don't 
care who dies, who suffers, or what price anyone pays for their own personal power. And whatever deal has been brokered, it's because for the moment, they obviously feel it's enough to buy them another day and carry on with trying to either maintain or muster more power. In Putin's case, obviously, he's desperate to hold on to it. And uh, Prigozhin himself has ambitions of his own, which go well beyond being head of the Wagner Group. We don't know exactly what they are, but, you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he was eyeing Putin's job. So it's all pretty terrifying. Robert, the, the uh, Mirror's headline is that uh, Putin pushed to the brink. Um, what, what do you think now happens to the man who, who pushed him to the brink? We know that he's uh, being, uh, well, I don't know if you describe it as forcibly moved or relocated to Belarus, but that's where he's moving to. But what do you think actually happens to him now? I think Prigozhin actually will last for quite a bit because he's an oligarch. He's a particularly tough, rough and unscrupulous, in other words, gangster, or, or, or oligarch. Remember how this started, and this started only a week ago in this, thing, in this phase, when uh, Prigozhin, on very widespread social media, denounced the operation in Ukraine as got up by oligarchs to stuff their pockets. That's why they wanted to take over Kiev. Now, these kinds of things, it's a drip feed that people do begin to have access to social media and they are affected by it. Because there is something very strange in Putinism that has happened this time, no crowds have turned out to support him. And usually the regime can whip up huge crowds to come out and say, yeah, our beautiful president, he can go on forever. And by the way, if we're talking about the future of, uh, 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 of Putin, he's due to be up for election. And we know it's all a beauty parade and nonsense, by and large, these presidential elections fixed in the first instance. The thing about a beauty contest uh, like this, uh, uh, of these kinds of show elections, you've got to look beautiful. And Putin doesn't look at all beautiful and nor very successful. And that's the real blow from this. We have seen him in setback mode in a way that his people haven't really before since he first became president in the early noughties. And this suggestion by the male Christina that the uh, leader of the Wagner group, Prigozhin, was um, offered a, a huge bribe by Vladimir Putin to um, call off his uh, assault or the march towards Moscow. Yeah, this is fascinating. I don't... It, it says that um, uh, British uh, officials or defence officials believe that he was offered um, millions. So, I mean, I wonder where they are. I'm, I'm sure they're not just, you know, speculating, but it would certainly explain the sudden backing down. And it was extremely unlikely that the offer of going to beautiful Belarus... Belarus itself would, itself would be enough to deter him from what he seemed deter, determined to do before. So it sounds plausible, but it, if that's the case, then it absolutely underlines Putin's weakness, because if he really has to throw money at people now to stop them marching on Moscow with their 25,000 conscripts, um, then that is you know, a sign of extraordinary weakness. So, yes, fascinating story. Robert, what, what do you think? Is it likely that it's all about the money? It's possible, but it's not all about the money. I mean, a few millions in a large sum would probably be chicken feed to Prigozhin. Prigozhin is in charge of a private military company, which is a euphemism for uh, a, a high-tech band that indulges in brigandage. I mean, they've taken over gold mines in Mali. They've got hold of rare earth elements mines. They know where to go. They're incredibly, potentially wealthy and actually wealthy in, in parts, but they dare to go where others won't. Places They've gone into um, uh, Sudan, they've been in Somalia, and I think that's part of the game of what, of, of what Prigozhin was doing. He wanted to keep this core group of thugs together. And that's why he would willingly have taken a bag of very, very dodgy rubles in order to transport them out of the country 
into Belarus. Now, apart from the whole Belarus thing is, is, is fascinating because I think it's extremely fragile. And, I, and we know Lukashenko isn't very strong. And now Putin absolutely o, 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 owes him. But what Prigozhin is saying, that Ukraine war, I've had it. You can take me out of it. And that is quite a vote because the Russian soldiery there will take that on board because a lot of the really dirty, nasty, terrible fighting, which shouldn't have gone on, it just made no sense from both sides, as long as it did in Bakhmut, was being done by the Wagner Group. I think, in terms of the deal and what is really going on and who is saying what to whom, we've only heard a smidgen of it, because part of the demand was that Wagner gets pay conditions and integrated with the Russian armed forces, but didn't want their command. I mean, what is the head of them sacked? And we want to know where General Gerasimov and uh, Mr Shoigu is. And by the way, in the last uh, 30 hours, Shoigu hasn't been seen. That's the Indeed. defence minister. Indeed. I wonder if we can um, cross to, to Christina just to, to get your thoughts via the, the yeah, Express yeah, sure. in terms of um, the, the wider conflict in Ukraine and what this means now. I, th I think we just don't know. Um, I, I see you're flashing up the story about the tech experts. Is that the one you want me to talk about, Gillian? No. <laughs> We're talking about the, oh, um, right, okay. the march on oh, Moscow. Right. No, we've got the wrong, of, the wrong visual there. Of, in terms of... Sorry. In terms of the wider conflict, I, I really honestly think we just don't know. I think obviously Ukraine will want to say this, this shows how weak Putin is and, you know, and how if you only give us more weapons, we will win. And I wish it was as simple as that. It certainly does show that, that Putin is, is weaker than, as we said, than, than he has thus allowed himself to appear. But I'm afraid I don't think it has any very clear implications for Ukraine. If, as Robert suggests, and I hadn't thought of that, if a Prizhog, a Prizhog, I can't pronounce it now, <laughs> Prizhogin, um, pri, pri, say again, I've, I've been talking about him all day and I've now completely Prigozhin. forgotten how to pronounce his name. If he does, if he does get out of there and go off to his other more lucrative interests, clearly that would have a, a, a different, make a difference because he's got 25,000 troops he'd be taking away from the battle. But okay. um, for the day, it's been a distraction for the Ukrainians Christina. and I'm sure they've been able to make We must progress. leave it there. Sorry.